Mount Zion Church, here we are ready to study the Word of God. I'm so glad that you have joined us. I'm so glad that you come to, to go with me into the Word. It's in the Word of God that we get strong. That's what we try to do here at Mount Zion, get strong in the Word of God, and then to put our faith in Jesus into action. So we need strength to do that. We need strength to follow Jesus. We need strength to be the people that God has called us to be. And that's what we're doing here, getting strong in his word. So let's pray, and then we'll begin. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the strength that you bring to our lives, Lord God. As we go to your word, we ask that you would fill us here now with your Holy Spirit. Lord God, that you would speak to us, that you would teach us, that you would strengthen us. Lord God, as, as we look now to your word, Father, we lift our hearts before you here. We pray for all those who are on our hearts. We thank you, Lord God, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we are studying the book of Revelation. We are up to chapter 13, and we are going to continue on. We see in this book of Revelation a series of visions or revelations that John was given and told to write them down. John, you remember, was one of Jesus' first disciples. And this is now many years after Jesus died on the cross, was raised up by the Father, was with his disciples a short time, then ascended and went to the Father. This is many years later. John is a leader of the church now in that part of the Roman Empire called Asia Minor. At this point, John is in prison. He's been imprisoned by the Roman government. They don't like what he's doing. He's in prison, and the Lord is giving him these visions. The heart of all of these visions was when John saw the Father, God the Father, seated on a throne holding a great throne, or holding a great scroll. And that scroll represented the future, your future, my future, the future of the whole world. And no one in heaven, no one on earth was found worthy to take that scroll from the Father except Jesus. And Jesus steps forward, and the Father gives to him this scroll. Jesus is worthy. The one who has loved us enough to go to hell on a cross for you and me, he is worthy to hold our future in his hands. And so that scroll had seven seals, or we might say today locks. And as these seals are broken, as these locks are unlocked, John sees one vision of the future after another. God was giving him these visions and telling him to write them down so that all of us would know what we need to know about the future so that we can make wise decisions today. So last week in chapters 11 and 12, we saw that the last of a series of seven trumpets, there were seven angels, each of whom had been given a trumpet. Each time a trumpet was blown, more about the future unfolded in front of John. We saw in last week's reading, chapter 11, and then on into verse 12, that the last of those seven trumpets was blown. And so now we're at the very end times of the history of this world. So this world, you know, it's only in this world as we know it now that we live in time. God is outside of time. We will be outside of time. But John here is given visions of the end, the very end of the history of this world in time as we know it. And these visions now continue. So we know as we're reading in chapter 11, 12, 13, and on, that now John is seeing the very, very end of time. So let's pick it up there in verse 1 in chapter 13. These visions, as we saw these last couple of weeks, had become, we might say, more bizarre as they continued. Stranger and stranger visions that John is seeing. And you know, one thing that tells me about living my life today, because here we're seeing a world that's getting farther and farther, the people of the world, not all the people, but many or the majority of the people of the world getting farther and farther away from God and the way God created us all to live. And things become more and more bizarre, more and more strange. And John is seeing these visions. So that tells me today, stay, Craig, stay with the Lord. Keep your life close to God. To live life not in a bizarre, strange way, to live life well. To live life with joy 
and peace and goodness and integrity. Stay close to God. So let's look at verse 1 here. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. He said, I saw a beast. So if we were to read in 1 John, we would read the term antichrist. If we were to read in Paul's letters, particularly in 1 Thessalonians, we'd see mention of the man of lawlessness. This antichrist, this man of lawlessness, this figure, this human figure who is to appear on the scene at the very end of time. John now sees this one uh, rising out of the sea. Now, what exactly it means to say rising out of the sea? Uh, scholars have pondered that one, not for sure, perhaps uh, representing one who first comes to power, first comes to the notice of the world along the sea. Uh, in other words, in a city, in a place near the ocean or a sea, perhaps. But he sees this one, this Antichrist, this one figure that will arise at the end of history who opposes everything to do with God, everything to do with Jesus. It says, with ten horns, Horns in ancient times were a symbol of power. So John's seen a vision. And what's it telling us about this one figure, this beast, this antichrist, this man of lawlessness, who is to appear on the scene at the very end of history? He will have great, great power. Seven heads. Not quite sure, again, the scholars pondering, what does it mean to have seven heads? Well, uh, one thing it can represent is uh, authority, great authority, not just raw power, uh, military power, but also uh, political power, political authority, governmental power. This one who is coming will have tremendous military power, will have tremendous political power. It says uh, with uh, ten diadems, that means crowns on its horns and blasphemous names on its head. The number 10, 10 diadems, perhaps representing 10 nations that come under the power of this one. Although it seems certainly as we continue to read that it's not just 10 nations that come under the power of this one. So maybe this one begins by consolidating his power in 10 nations. And then that power expands to the whole earth. Blasphemous names on its heads. The word blasphemy means to call that which is holy evil and to call that which is evil holy. This one who will appear will call the holy God evil and will call that which is evil in this world holy and good. Now, if you remember, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians that the coming of Christ to this earth, when that last trumpet sounds will not happen until this man of lawlessness, until this Antichrist is revealed. He's on the scene. And so we've seen now the last trumpet has blown, and this one now appears. This one appears. This, this Antichrist, this beast, this man of lawlessness with great, great power who is opposed to, who opposes anything to do with God, anything to do with our Lord and Savior Jesus. At verse 2, and the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Well, we would find here a reference to the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. And we might wonder what uh, is represented as John sees this beast that, that looks uh, like a leopard, its feet like a bear, its mouth like a lion's. Well, we certainly see here all animals that cause great destruction. Animals that are dangerous. This one who is to come will be dangerous. So uh, persons who lived through the horrors of Nazi Germany as Adolf Hitler came on the scene. Well, uh, many who were believers thought surely this was the Antichrist, the beast, the man of lawlessness who had come. Well, it turned out he wasn't. But he was certainly like unto him, a very dangerous, powerful, evil man. So, continuing there in verse 2, and to it, the dragon, we saw the dragon last week. John saw a vision of a dragon. The dragon was the devil. 
Satan himself. That angel who rebelled against God was cast out of heaven, came down to this earth in great fury, came down to destroy, to destroy the people of God, to destroy all the, the, the work of God in, in hearts. So, and to it, so to the beast, to this antichrist, this man of lawlessness, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. The devil gives his power. The devil gives his authority. The devil gives great political, great military power to this antichrist. Certainly, Adolf Hitler was calling on the power of the devil himself. And we can see back through history, horrible dictators, horrible kings. Joseph Stalin, probably the worst dictator in the history of the world, was certainly calling upon Satan. Well, Satan will give his power, his authority to this one who is to come. And if you remember in 1 John, he speaks of the Antichrist, but he also says many Antichrists have appeared. He was writing to believers in that first century. Already he was saying many Antichrists have appeared. In other words, there will be many who are in power in this world, who have positions of authority, governmental power, military power, who in fact are drawing their power from the devil himself. And so for believers living in lands where the government is a government of great evil and great wickedness, what can we learn from this? That God told us this is how it will be. Not only will there, will there be an antichrist, a man of lawlessness at the end of time, but many antichrists up until that time. And so we look at our brothers and sisters who have uh, lived under great persecution from governments that have been wicked and evil. And yet, what do we learn from history? And what have we learned even last week as we, as we read of the two prophets who were preaching, nothing can stop the word of God. No antichrist, no man of lawlessness, no government with great evil and great power can stop the work of Jesus. Nobody can stop the work of Jesus. Nobody can stop the people of Jesus. When we get discouraged, when we look around and see so much corruption, we see so much wickedness, when we get discouraged, we are not to plunge into despair. And we are not to plunge into anger and fury. We are to know that God said, this is the way it will be. You be faithful. You continue to be faithful to Jesus. You continue to win heart after heart after heart to the love of Jesus. You continue to let the light of Jesus shine. It doesn't matter the opposition coming against you or against all of God's people in this world. Here's Jesus saying to us, you just continue. It doesn't matter who's getting their power from the devil. You just continue to let the light of Jesus shine. And so at verse 3, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So it appeared that this man had received a mortal wound. right? Uh, reminding us again of Adolf Hitler. You remember when Adolf Hitler staged that bombing, right? And supposedly he was in this beer hall in Germany and the place was bombed. And it was a miracle that he escaped alive. But in fact, the whole thing was staged. It was staged to cause people to marvel at Adolf Hitler, to say he's invincible, no one can stop him. And so the people of the world will marvel at this one who seemed perhaps to have been assassinated but survived. People of the world will marvel when they see this one. And so we see here this picture that John is seeing now, this one who will arise and the people are marveling at the power. He seems to be invincible. Nothing can stop him. And of course, we've read all these visions uh, thus far of all the great trouble coming on the earth. And here comes this strong man who can save us all. Isn't that how Adolf Hitler presented himself to the people of Germany? That he could save them from all their economic struggles, financial woes. That is how this beast, this Antichrist at the end of time will present himself. And people will be amazed. And more and more they will look to him. More and more they will be stunned and, and just want to follow this beast, this man of lawlessness. At verse 4 then. 
and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the devil. They worshipped the devil himself. They worshipped wickedness. They worshipped evil. They worshipped the devil himself. For he had given his authority to the beast. They recognized where this power, this authority were coming. That's what John's seeing. That's what he's, he's telling us about the future. That, yeah, they, the, the world will not worship God, the Lord, not worship the one who is truly holy. The world will follow the lead of this beast, this man of lawlessness, and call the one who is truly holy evil. And they will call the one who is, in fact, evil, holy and good. And they will follow him and worship him. What are we learning about living our life right now? It doesn't matter what those all around us say or do. We keep our eyes on the one who is truly good. We keep our eyes on the one who is truly holy. We follow after him. We worship him and him alone. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? And the devil put, you know, one temptation in front of another. In, uh, in front of, of Jesus, one temptation after another in front of Jesus. And finally, you know, the devil said, look, bow down, worship me, and I'll give you all authority in, in the, on the earth, you know, forever. And what did Jesus say? Be gone, Satan. Be gone. You know, the fact that someone gets great power, the fact perhaps that you can receive great power or great wealth or whatever it might be, does not say, well, this is a good and a right thing, or that is a good and a right person. No, here's this one who seems to survive an assassination attempt. Here's this one who is just, his power is growing and growing, and, and people are just turning to him. They're even worshiping the devil. And what this is saying to me, what this is saying to all of us, is don't make your choices, don't make your decisions based on what everyone else is saying. You keep looking to the Lord. You keep looking to God himself. You keep looking to the one who in the end will triumph. Who in the end will prevail. Whose goodness, whose love, whose mercy, whose kindness, whose holiness will in the end prevail. We live in a world in which it seems as if wickedness always prevails. We live in a world in which it seems as if lying and violence and wickedness always win the day. And here's our God saying, don't believe that lie. Don't believe that lie. You look to the one who said, love. The greatest of these is love. You look to the one who said, above all else, hold unfailing your love for one another. You look to the one who said, love your enemies. You look to the one who said, forgive those who have done you wrong. You look at the one who said, open your hand freely to the poor and the needy. We look to the one who commands us to do what is good and holy and right, even though it would appear in this world that these things do not prevail, that these things do not win the day. It certainly will look at that very end of time as if wickedness is prevailing, as if wickedness is winning. But that's the way it always will look. Stay true, stay true to the Lord. So at that verse 4, they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, and they worshiped this one, this, this, this human being who had great power, military power, political power. They worshiped him. They worshiped him, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? Who can stop him? Nothing stops him. Nothing stops him at all. He's so strong. He's so powerful. And so they turn to him. They look to him to be the solution, the solution of their problems. They look to him to be the savior for a world that was falling apart. They look to this one and say, he's the one that we can trust. He's the one that we can follow. He's the one we must listen to. Wow. Wow. Have you ever watched films of Adolf Hitler giving speeches? And perhaps if you don't speak the German language, they have English subtitles under them. And you look at these massive crowds just hanging on every word this man said. Every word this man said. A man who would unleash such wickedness, such horrors. A man who would unleash such evil upon the world. Slaughtering 10, 11 million people. 
in the gas chambers and in the death squads that would just round up Jews and others and just slaughter them with their guns. People hung on every word that he spoke. Who is like this beast? Who can fight against it? Who can stop him? And they worshipped his power. They worshipped his strength. Don't ever worship power. Don't ever worship strength. Worship the Lord God and him alone. At verse 5, And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. It was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words words. Prideful, haughty. What does the scripture say? Pride goes before a fall. It says the man with haughty looks shall fall. Oh no, we are not to be attracted to pridefulness. Isn't that strange? We get attracted. You know, sometimes we, we see people and their pridefulness just turns us off, but there's a certain kind of pridefulness that attracts us to it attracts us to the one who has a certain kind of pridefulness and haughtiness. And here, the people of the earth are attracted to this pridefulness and this haughtiness of this one, was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. Words that are blasphemous. Words that, in fact, call evil good and good evil, as the scripture says. Attracted to this one, this one who has great, great power. The people of the world following after him. The people of the world worshiping him. And yet he speaks blasphemous words. Speaks, so whole, love is a holy thing. A blasphemous word calls love evil. Kindness is a, a holy thing. These things are from God. It's God who commands us to be kind. It's God who commands us to love. But this one speaks blasphemous words. Calling kindness, calling love evil. Jesus, our holy Savior, the Lord God himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God the Son, who came to this earth. But this one will call Jesus evil and wicked. Wow. And it was allowed to exercise authority, going back to verse 5 here, it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. We keep seeing this time period of three and a half years. Now, we have a time period of seven years, and we keep seeing this time period of three and a half years, this time period, uh, three and a half, three and a half. So, so keep that in your mind as we continue. We've already been seeing this three and a half years, uh, sometimes uh, spoken of this way, 42 months, sometimes spoken of this way, time, a time and times and half a time, three and a half and then sometimes spoken three and a half years. Keep that in mind now, this three and a half year time period. So this one was allowed, did you get that word? Allowed to exercise authority. Allowed by who? Allowed by God himself. Even this one who the whole world, virtually the whole world is worshiping, whom virtually the whole world is following, this one who seems to have just invincible power, God himself only allows him to exercise his authority for three and a half years. No, no, no. The devil himself, this beast, this antichrist, this man of lawlessness, and whatever evil comes against you right now today, no evil, no wickedness, no tragedy, no sorrow can come against you, except that God knows it. And here's what we have to swallow, even allows it. Even allows it. This is where we must exercise our faith. This is where we must trust in him. That even when he allows wickedness to come, even when he allows tragedy and sorrow and sadness to come, we must trust as Job did finally in the end. You remember Job got so angry at God and said, what, God, aren't you as good as I thought? What, are you up there sleeping? Job got so angry at God. And what did God say to Job? Job, were you there when I put the stars in the sky? Job, were you there when I put the whales in the ocean? Were you there, Job, when I did all of these things? Do you know how to do these things, Job? In other words, God was saying to Job, Job, are you as wise as I am? And finally, Job humbles himself and chooses to trust, to trust in God. And so when wickedness seems to be prevailing over our lives, in other words, when wicked people seem to, to win the day, when tragedy or sorrow come, we trust then, we trust 
in Jesus. We trust in our Heavenly Father that He is wise. We trust that even when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace, when Daniel was thrown into the den of lions, how could that be? How could that be? We trust when we're thrown into the fiery furnace, when we're thrown into the den of lions, how could it be when Jesus said, you know what, they hate me, they'll hate you. They'll take my life, they'll take your life. We trust even if our lives are taken, if our lives are taken by wickedness and evil, if our lives are taken in tragedy and sadness, we trust our God. We trust him no matter what. And so he's allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Keep that three and a half year time period in your mind as we continue to work through. It becomes clear what this is about uh, as we continue to work through this book of Revelation. So at verse 6, it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Blaspheming the name of God. This political figure, this military political figure of great authority, he blasphemes God himself. In other words, he says, this God that you all have worshipped, this God that you all have believed in, this God that so many have trusted and followed, he's not good, he's evil. He blasphemes God himself. He blasphemes heaven. Oh, all those people who've died and think they're in heaven. All those people who put their faith in Jesus and think they're in heaven. This antichrist, this beast, this man of lawlessness blasphemes. Blasphemes heaven, blasphemes all of them. Saying, don't keep your faith in Jesus. He's saying, don't you be trust in Jesus and think that he has heaven waiting for you. What is this telling me right now? This is telling me there will be all kinds of lies, maybe whispered in my ear now by the devil, shouted to me maybe by those who hate him now, and the world one day will have the most powerful person in the world, the most powerful person in the world, telling the world you're fools to believe in Jesus. Oh, let's not just stop here in the middle of the book. Let's keep reading this book of Revelation to see the end of this beast, to see the end of this devil who gave this beast, this antichrist, all of his power, to see the end of all those horrible antichrists through the centuries, to see the end of all those who just gave themselves over to wickedness and never would repent, never would humbly cry out for mercy. Let's remember the end of the story here. Let's keep reading toward the end of this story so that we hold on no matter what. You know, if we thought, well, wickedness is just going to win the day, evil, the devil, whatever, is just going to win the day, then we might very well say, what's the point of even trying? What's the point of believing in God? What's the point of following Jesus? What's the point of love? What's the point of kindness? What's the point of integrity and goodness? If we concluded by looking at the wickedness of this world that wickedness was going to win, then we would say, what's the point? The point is God has given us here what we need to know about the future, that this beast will not win the day. Oh, he'll exercise authority for 42 months. Oh, the horrible dictators back through the history of this world persons of great wickedness now who never repent, they might win the day for a time period, but they will not win the day. So at verse 7, also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. This beast, this antichrist is allowed to make war on the people of God, the people who have put their faith. Saints means the holy ones. The people who have been washed clean by the blood of the lamb, the holy ones the people who are keeping their faith in Jesus, the people who, are, uh, who have put their faith in him and are holding on to their faith in him, he makes war. In other words, great persecution breaks out again. In, in chapter 11, we read about great persecution. Well, now it breaks out all the more as this beast, this antichrist comes. He's allowed, again, allowed. It's only God allowing him. It's the God we can trust. The God who is love, who's allowing him to do so. We trust him even when war breaks out against us. We trust in God no matter what. He was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, to conquer them, to conquer them. 
What, to, to steal their faith? What, to turn them away from Jesus? Or perhaps to conquer them, to take their lives? Well, let's go on to see. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. What? Wait a minute. Authority was given it over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So now it becomes worldwide. Maybe it began with ten nations, but it becomes worldwide authority. Worldwide power. And all, all who dwell on earth, at verse 8 there, all who dwell on earth will worship it. What? Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Those whose name was not written in that book of life. They will worship this one. There are people who would say, you know what, I, I, I can't really believe in this Jesus. Yeah, he was a great guy, whatever, he taught good stuff, but I, I can't really worship him. I can't really believe in him, but I certainly would never, like, you know, follow the devil. I would never do anything uh, so wicked and so evil like that. Well, here God's telling us not true. Not true. Ultimately, the pressure in life, even just this, learn from this what will happen and look at our life today. Ultimately, the pressures of life, ultimately the struggles of life bring us all to a choosing, to a moment of choice. And if we do not put our faith, in other words, if we do not humble ourselves before God, if we do not humble ourselves before Jesus, if we do not humbly acknowledge, I need the mercy, the forgiveness, the grace that he brought to me, that he offers to me, uh, having gone to that cross, if we do not humble ourselves before him, then there is no evil that we might not give ourselves to. In fact, we will give ourselves over just to selfishness, just to pure selfishness. Oh, you might not ever become a murderer. You might not ever become a rapist. You might not ever become this or that. But, you know, we destroy with our mouths as much as we might destroy with our hands. We kill with our mouths as much as we might kill with our hands. Wow. Wow. And so, what's, what's God telling us right, right here? That everyone whose name has not been written in the book of life will worship this beast. You put your faith in Jesus and you keep it there. So, what is this book of life? In that verse 8 there, everyone's name who has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. They were all. The book of life of the Lamb. Now, here's an interesting fact we will see by the end of this book. That everyone's name was written in that book. That God didn't create anyone to die and go to hell. Everyone's name was written in that book of life. But there were many whose names were blotted out. Their names were blotted out of the book of life. Blotted out, not, oh, when they finally died and never gave Jesus. No, God knows long before whether you will or you won't. He keeps reaching and reaching to every single one of us. But he knows who will or who won't get humble. Who's will, who will or, or won't repent, turn to him. Who will humbly say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the pain and the hurt I've caused. I'm sorry I, I turned my back on you. God knows and blots out those names. Now, that sounds kind of like fate. This is not talking about fate. Fate is the belief of other spiritualities, other religions, not of this book. Fate, so in other spiritualities, in other religions, means if you have been given a certain fate, that means that your future has been predetermined, predetermined by God, and there's no possible way that you can escape it. That's not what this book is about. No one has been given a fate. Oh, we've been given a destiny, a destiny that you can grab hold of or turn your back on, that you can pursue or run away from. God knows whether you're going to pursue it or run away from it, whether you're going to grab hold of your destiny or not. He knows all that. He knows who won't grab hold of their destiny. Their names are blotted out, but it's not like he assigned them a fate. It's not like he doesn't keep appealing to them. It's not like he doesn't do every possible thing. Jesus so what? God so loved the world that Jesus went to that cross and died. 
So it's not like somebody has a fate to go to hell. No, God does every possible thing to, rec to, to rescue every single one of us from our own wickedness, our own sinfulness, our own selfishness, from the hell that that, that brings to our lives. But those who will never, who just won't, they won't humble themselves. They won't repent. They won't turn to him. Their names are blotted out of that book of life. Turn to him. Humble yourself. Put your faith in this one who died. The Lord, the God himself who died on a cross, went to hell for you. Humble yourself and put your faith in him. Keep it there. Those who don't do so, there's no end. There's no end of the selfishness, the foolishness, the wickedness that they will embrace. And that's the picture we're, be we're being given here. They will embrace this one who is pure wickedness because they wouldn't turn to Jesus. So at verse 9, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. Listen to this. Here's, here's, here's what we've just been saying. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. In other words, you can choose your course of action. You can choose which path you want to travel. If you want to travel a path of arrogant, prideful rejection of God, of arrogant, prideful, self-centered living, you can choose that. But you can't choose what consequences will go with the action that you've chosen. You can choose your action. You can choose the road you want to travel. But the consequences that will follow from your choice, you can't choose those. Those who choose to reject him, to reject this Savior who died strictly for our sake, can't choose the consequences that will follow. They will give themselves over to this beast. Or, you know, maybe not, if this day has not yet come, they will choose to give themselves over to selfishness and wickedness and utter rejection of God, and they'll reap the consequences of it. So if anyone is to be taken captive, if that's the consequence of their action, to captivity he goes. No one can escape their consequences. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, well, with the sword he must be slain. You can't escape your consequences. What, what, what does the scripture say? Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. That's a consequence. So look at the end of verse 10. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Endure in the faith. Endure. No matter what it takes, hold on to Jesus. Do not reject him. No matter how hard life becomes, no matter how much tragedy surrounds you, no matter how much wickedness comes against you, no matter how appealing the world is, no matter how appealing things are that are not of God seem to be, endure, hold on to Jesus. Hold on to the word of God. Hold on. Hold on no matter what. Here is a call. He's saying learn from all of this. Here is a call for the endurance and faith. Keep your faith. Keep your faith in Jesus. You know what I've observed through the years? Why people turn away from their faith? Is they have faith in Jesus. And then maybe some hard time comes in life. And like Job, they get angry. And they lose their faith. They give up on their faith. Or they fall in some temptation. The appeal of the world. The appeal of the world captures someone. And now, and now they have to have a reason. They have to justify in their mind why they've gone this way. And they say, I don't know about that Jesus stuff anymore. I just don't know about that Jesus stuff anymore. It's not because in their mind they actually thought this Jesus stuff doesn't make any sense. No, it's because of their course of action. And now they have to justify why they've gone down this road. Because, you know, you can't live with two different opposite things going on in your brain. Keep your faith. If you have chosen poorly, if you've gone down the wrong road, don't now try to figure out how to get rid of your faith in Jesus. Turn back to Jesus. And you say, I can't. I've gone too far down this road. You can. 
you can turn back to him. No matter how far away from him you are, you turn and look back to him and call out to him. He'll be there. And he'll give you the strength to come back. Do not, do not give up your faith in Jesus. Do not get so angry at God that you can't believe anymore. Trust in him. And if you've gone away from him, look back to him, cry out for help. Maybe you've done some horrible thing that you never thought you would do and you say to yourself, I, I, I just can't even bear to be near Jesus anymore because my guilt, my shame is, is too great and you can't handle that guilt and shame anymore so you just try to put Jesus out of your mind. No, turn to him. Look for forgiveness, look for mercy. Hold on to him because there's no depth to which you won't go once you let go of Jesus. That's pretty much what this whole chapter so far, this chapter 13, is about. If you let go of Jesus, there's no depth of evil to which you won't eventually go. Well, let's go to verse 11. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. That first beast, that man of lawlessness, that antichrist, he said, rose out of the sea, perhaps meaning first appearing in the, you know, to the attention of the world at some city or place near the sea. Well, this one arising out of the earth, perhaps coming from some place in the middle of a continent somewhere. Who knows what all that means? But it had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon had two horns, not the, not the ten horns of the beast, not as much power as the beast, that first beast that he saw, but still power, two horns, like a lamb. Well, wait a minute, who is the lamb? Jesus. This one who would appear to be like Jesus. This one who would appear to represent Jesus. This one who would have some power appearing to represent Jesus. We'll see as we go on in this book of Revelation that this second beast is also called the false prophet, the false preacher. There will be this religious leader that comes on the scene in those last three and a half years who has great power and appears to speak in the name of Jesus, but what? Spoke like a dragon. Who's the dragon? The devil. But was speaking the words not of Jesus, but of the devil. How many times did Jesus warn his followers and warn us about false prophets? Clothed in sheep's clothing, right? Wolves, but clothed in sheep's clothing, looking like one of the sheep, looking like one of the followers of Jesus, but inwardly ravenous wolves. We learn from this, we learn from Jesus that not everyone who looks like they are a man or woman of God are. Their words might be smooth, they might have great success, but the test is, what did Jesus say? You'll know them by their fruits. What are the fruits? Well, Jesus, or Paul the Apostle spelled out the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, right? You'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them. Do they live as Jesus commanded us to live? Are their words the words of Jesus? Are there words, words of love and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness, self-control, right? Mercy. Wow. It exercises at verse 12. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. This false prophet, this false religious leader now, supports, props up that antichrist, that or military governmental person of great power. This false prophet props him up. And so it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. And so this false religious leader now leads the world in worshiping this beast. Points the world. This one who's, who, who appears to be like, uh, you know, a lamb who appears to be one of the sheep, appears to be a man of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, leads the world now in looking to, in following after, in worshiping that first beast. At verse 13, it performs great signs. In other words, miracles. False signs, false miracles. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people speaks and fire comes down 
fire and comes down from heaven to earth. And by the signs that it is allowed, there it is again, that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So, again, allowed. Is this false religious prophet, this false prophet, this one who leads the people to where the people of the world to worship this antichrist, this man of lawlessness? Is this one beyond the power and the authority of God himself? Nope. God allows him to do it for a time. He allows him to do it for a time. But God is still God. Will we come, again, will we come to that? Maybe you have been harmed greatly by some false prophet. Maybe at some point in your life, someone who, you know, spoke the name of Jesus, who claimed to be a follower of Jesus, did you great, great, great wrong. And maybe you've had a hard, hard time trusting Jesus ever since. Maybe you've had a hard time really believing in God. Maybe you've had a hard time getting close to God. Maybe you've kept your belief, but you're having a hard time getting close to God ever since. Will you come to that place? Will we all come to that place like Job finally did? He never got an answer, not in this life. He never got an answer why God allowed all those horrible things. You remember that it happened to Job's family and to Job. Job never got the answer of why, but he ended up deciding, I will trust him. When God reminded him, Job, are you as wise as me? And so we choose then, even when there are persons claiming the name, you know, claiming faith in Jesus, speaking in the name of Jesus, wolves in sheep's clothing, we choose to trust God no matter what. You know, many people have rejected the faith. Many people don't want anything to do with church because someone in church did them great wrong, and not just someone, maybe many people. But this is what Jesus told us would happen. There will be many false prophets. John said there will be many antichrists. There will be many, many who are not truly followers of Jesus. And so, it, at verse 14 then, and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He leads them now even to making an image, even having, a, you know, a painting, a statue, whatever it is, to worship this one. You know, there have been many dictators back through the history of the world who have just plastered their nation with billboards, with paintings, with statues of themselves. I had the opportunity many years ago to go on a mission trip to Cuba. Cuba is plastered at the time, plastered with billboards of Fidel everywhere. Fidel, Fidel Castro. Just billboards, pictures, paintings, statues everywhere. So at this end time that we're reading about right here, the, this, this false prophet will promote that, worshiping this one. Follow this one. Follow this one. Follow this one. Follow this one. Wow. At verse, look at verse 15. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. And so what, what do we see here now that somehow miraculously, miraculously through the, uh, through the, the, the power that's given to this false prophet, he causes breath to come into this statue, this painting, and people now are worshiping it, and the ones who aren't worshiping it are slain. At verse 16, also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand, on the right hand, right, or the forehead. Now, it causes uh, persons now to, be, to have a mark either on, on their hand or on their forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So now this religious false prophet institutes this thing where throughout the whole earth there's a mark that's given and if you don't have that mark on your hand or your forehead, you're excluded from the society economically. You can't buy, you can't sell unless you have this mark. You go to the store, they won't sell to you. 
And so what is, it says the name or the number of its name. So at, look at verse 18. This calls for wisdom, let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. 666. I'll never forget being in Manhattan, driving in Manhattan in New York City years and years ago. And up there, I'm looking up, and all of a sudden, in huge red neon letters uh, on, a, on a, one of the skyscrapers in Manhattan is 666. Freaked me out. Freaked me out. Wow. And so here, so here, he said, this calls for wisdom. Calculate the number of the beast. In other words, if you, if you calculate the letters and numbers, it will come to this number 666. Hmm. You know what? Let's hold that mystery, that 666. We'll begin again next week in chapter 14. What have we learned overall from this chapter 13? What have we learned? Hold on to Jesus no matter what. If you don't, who knows where you'll go? Who knows what wickedness, what selfishness you'll embrace. Hold on to him no matter what comes against you. Don't let go. Don't give up your faith in Jesus. He's an awesome, awesome God. I hope you'll go back, read carefully through this chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. If you haven't been with us throughout this whole study, all the Bible studies are right there on our website. Just go to mzpraise, P-R-A-Y-S dot org. Click Bible study and you'll find all of our Bible studies here on this book of Revelation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God. You will guard us from deception. You will guard our hearts, Lord God, from wickedness, from selfishness. You will guard our hearts, Lord God, if we keep our faith in Jesus. And so, Lord God, help us. Help us. Give us the strength to hold on to fight the good fight, to run the race well, to keep the faith, to keep our faith in Jesus no matter what. Give us that confidence. Give us that assurance, Lord God, that you win the day, that no matter what wickedness seems to triumph in this world, no matter what tragedy comes against us in this world, give us that faith. As we will see as we continue to read this book of Revelation, give us that faith that your love wins the day. We thank you, Father. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, Mount Zion. See you soon.